You conquer people by telling them of battles, kings, elephants, and marvelous beings, by speaking to them about the happiness they will find beyond death, the bright light that presided over their birth, the angels wheeling around them, the demons menacing them, and love, love, that promise of oblivion and satiety. Everything is harder once you reach man's estate, living shut up inside yourself, hairy, destitute, full of memories. I'm not taking this trip for nothing. I'm not curling up like a dog on this seat for nothing. I'm going to save something. I'm going to save myself despite the world that persists in going forward laboriously at the speed of a hand car operated by a man with one arm. We ourselves in the desert under the Bedouin's tent, although faced with the most tangible reality of nomad life, we're coming up against our own representations, which by our preconceptions interfered with the possibility of experiencing this life that was not our own. The poverty of these women and men seemed to us to be full of the poetry of the ancients. Their destitution reminded us of that of the hermits and mystics. Their superstitions made us travel through time. The exoticism of their condition prevented us from understanding their vision of existence, just as they saw us with our bareheaded woman, our SUV, and our rudimentary Arabic, as eccentric idiots, possibly whose money and even car they envied, but certainly not our knowledge or intelligence, not even our technology. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today we are talking about Matthias Enard. Matthias Enard is a French novelist. He's really a scholar novelist whose work is enriching the field of Orientalism. By the time I was finishing up Compass, which is his last work to be translated into English and also the winner of the prestigious Prix Goncourt, it is an incredible novel, but it was reminding me of my post-colonial studies and my multicultural studies in grad school when we read through Orientalism by Edward W. Said. So I went and got an updated copy and just picked through the preface and the introductory chapter and the afterward at the end. But then I got so wrapped up in it again that I ended up reading it all the way through. And I cannot stress enough how important this work is. It came out in 77 or 78 and went through a bunch of different translations. It erupted within the field of Orientalism. In fact, when Enar in the book Compass, when the characters invoke the name of Said, it sends a shudder through all of the in, uh, Orientalists in the book, but this was wildly misunderstood by so many people. And in the afterword, really takes care to point out all of the major criticisms and misinterpretations and then offer a beautiful uh, rebuttal. But beyond just Occidentalism versus Orientalism, this book is so important for our increasingly polarized society globally, whether it's because of gender or one orientation or another, religious affiliation, whether we like the Yankees or the Red Sox, big books versus small books. This is such an important piece of scholarship. It's increasingly relevant for how we critique not the people, but the power structures and imperialism that bubbles up through our rhetoric. It's a way of understanding how images and representations of people can create these stubborn stigmas and stereotypes and prejudices that are so hard to then excise and scrape out of our thinking. And this is what a lot of Matthias Enar's work is about. I started off with Tell Them of Battles, Kings, and Elephants, which is put out in this beautiful hardcover with this gorgeous 
cover art by New Directions. It's translated by Charlotte Mandel. Of the three books of Einar's that I've read and we'll be talking about this one and then Zone from Open Letter and Compass from New Directions, they're all three translated by Mandel. That's always nice when you've got the same translator across uh, works for the same author. I think this one works very well if you just want to take a toe dip in the pool of Enar's work. I think you'll find that the water is very pleasing. At a scant just barely 200 pages, it also presents many of the themes that you're going to see throughout his work. This one is historical fiction. It's based on Michelangelo in about 1504. The Sultan of Constantinople commissions him to come and design a bridge that will go over the Golden Horn. Now, what really intrigues Michelangelo, what really drives him beyond the exoticism of his representation of the Orient, of the Ottoman Empire, is that Leonardo da Vinci has already been commissioned and his design was rejected. So this is Michelangelo's moment to achieve immortality by having his work his genius accepted over Leonardo da Vinci's. It's a very patient and lush book, which is the same for Zone and Compass. Enar proves himself to be a wonderful novelist, very imaginative, really putting himself in the minds of these characters and in the time and place. Leonardo's drawing obsesses him. It is vertiginous, but flawed, empty, lifeless, lacking ideals. Decidedly, Leonardo takes himself for Archimedes and forgets beauty. Beauty comes from abandoning the refuge of the old forms for the uncertainty of the present. Michelangelo is not an engineer, he is a sculptor. They sent for him so that a form could be born from matter, be drawn, be revealed. I love the way Enar really gets into the mind of the genius that is Michelangelo. He's one of the few who excelled in three different art forms, that being sculpture, painting, and poetry. And I love right here how Enar captures the artistic obsession of Michelangelo and how these lines are echoed beautifully with this wonderful cover design. In fact, I'll hold it up as I read it. And more than anything, he loved drawing the black wound of the ink that caress scraping the grain of the paper. The next book I read was Zone. I was totally unprepared for this because Tell Them of Battles, Kings, and Elephants doesn't follow this same form at all. This isn't a narrative of historical fiction. This is an interior monologue, which will take the same form in Compass. In fact, both Zone and Compass take place within the mind of its principal narrator over the course of a single night. We have a French-born Croatian spy who is on a train going from Milan to Rome to meet some people coming out of Vatican City to hand over a briefcase full of all kinds of reconnaissance secrets. The more we read, the more we can feel the shame and regret and the weight of the sins that weigh on Francis Mirkovich. It says in several places and blurbs that it's a modern Iliad, but I would also submit that it's a modern odyssey at the same time. He's traveling away from the wars of the Iliad, and he's trying to achieve a sort of homecoming. This is Odysseus as a spy coming out of the Balkan Wars. It's also a confessional. It's a book of purgation. We, the readers, become the priests for Mirkovich to confess all of his sins. One major achievement for Einar in this work is just like in Battles and Kings, how he can put himself inside the mind of someone like Michelangelo. Here, he can put himself in the mind of a spy. Will I be able to rid myself of myself the way you take off a sweater in an overheated train? Heroes are often wreathed in shadows marked by Hades, great eater of warriors. Memory is, of course, at the forefront of this novel, since it's inside the mind of someone who's living 
retrospectively throughout the course of this night. Everything is harder once you reach man's estate, living shut up inside yourself, hairy, destitute, full of memories. But while at the same time there's such an importance of this single character's memory, it's also about the deterioration of collective memory. Here, so many people have suffered, and this sentence had no meaning for them, or so little. That's normal. It will come to have less and less, just as today the monuments to the dead of 1914 in France don't affect anyone anymore. Aside from the, all of the wars and skirmishes around the breakup of Yugoslavia, we get a lot out of World War II and the Spanish photographer who was commissioned by these Nazi agents to take pictures of the goings-on there in Mauthausen. It's unbelievable. And just like the character in this book, you have to wonder, what were these Nazi guards thinking of having this terrible evidence memorialized? In fact, there's a movie on Netflix about this photographer from Mauthausen. As he is ruminating over and over on all of this destruction, you start to realize more and more war's indelible stamp upon the human mind. Another major theme that I've already talked about and that is even more pronounced in Compass comes in here with Zone, and that is the European penetration and conception of the Orient. The zone is in fact the area around the Mediterranean basin that covers a lot of these different places that are gonna come up again and again. And it's no wonder because Einar studied Persian and Arabic. He stayed for extended periods of time in the Middle East. He has been a professor of world literature in Berlin. And he has obviously made the acquaintance of many, many different specialists in these fields. He talks about European and American artists, so let's say occidental Western artists who have made their way to the Middle Eastern and Mediterranean basin areas, such as Joyce and Trieste and Burroughs and Tangiers. Mirkovich thinks about his love for reading, curious this passion for reading, a remnant from Venice, from Marianne, great devourer of books, a way to forget, to disappear wholly into paper, Little by little, I replaced adventure novels with simply novels. That's Conrad's fault, he says. Nostromo and Heart of Darkness, one title calls for another. And maybe without really understanding, who knows, I let myself be carried away, page after page. And although I've already spent a large part of my day as an ambiguous functionary reading notes, reports, forms on my well-guarded screen, there is nothing I desire more than a novel where the people our characters, a play of masks and desires, and little by little to forget myself, forget my body at rest in this chair, forget my apartment building, Paris, life itself as the paragraphs, dialogues, adventures, strange worlds flow by. And he's taking what pleasure he can still find in this life. And pleasure, of course, is so fleeting. He says pleasure is a lightning bolt that leaves no trace. And encompass we find a beautiful metaphor for the ephemerality of pleasure and desire in the symbol of opium. And finally, I just recently finished off Compass. This is, to me, well-deserving of the pre core. It is his current magnum opus. I'm sure that he'll still have plenty of books coming out. This one absolutely blew me away. Again, like Zone, this one takes place across the course of a single night. However, <laughs> instead of a spy who has obviously been a part of all kinds of crazy things, this is just a gentle, lonely Viennese scholar. His name is Franz Ritter. And at the same time as he's dealing with insomnia all night and thinking over the work and the scholarship with Orientalism that has obsessed him as a musicologist, he's also playing out this love story in his mind and thinking about the great love of his life, Sarah, whom he's 
never really managed to connect with on the romantic level that he has built up in his mind. So the plot is very simple. Just like the plot of Zone is a man thinks about his life while on a train overnight from Milan to Rome. Here, it's a man thinks about his life while dealing with insomnia over the course of one night. But what you really get is an extended and beautiful discourse or an Orientalism and a love tale between two modern scholars. Enar writes the characters of scholars here, Orientalists. He writes them so well. It's very apparent that he's spent a lot of time in academia. I am decidedly an armchair scholar, Ritter says of himself, whereas Sarah is much more intrepid. He's Austrian. She's French. He's a skeptic and given more to reason. She is a lover of Kafka and Pessoa and believes deeply in the interconnectedness of all things. He has a sort of latent impetism that invades many facets of his life. For example, he is a musicologist, but many people mistake him for a musician, and he has to admit that he actually cannot play any instruments. Though he knows how to read music and even write music, he can't play instruments, whereas Sarah is indefatigable and vigorous and vibrant. And so with these contrasts in the two central characters that we'll get, what we're dealing with is a word and theme that occurs over and over in this novel, and that is alterity, otherness, the other, which connects right in with Orientalism. You can see the influence of Edward W. Said's book, all through Compass. In fact, when some of these scholarly Orientalists are camping out together, he says, the debate became stormy. Sarah had mentioned the great name, capital G, capital N. The wolf had appeared in the midst of the flock, in the freezing desert, Edward, Said. It was like invoking the devil in a Carmelite convent. A couple hundred pages later, we get this. The question was not whether or not Said was right or wrong in his vision of Orientalism. The problem was the breach, the ontological fissure his readers had allowed between a dominating West and a dominated East. A breach that, by opening up well beyond colonial studies, contributed to the realization of the model it created. That completed a posteriori the scenario of domination which Said's thinking meant to oppose. And so he's right in evoking this concept of the devil in a Carmelite convent because especially amongst Orientalists, there was an outrage at what Said was doing in his book. But really, Orientalism is neither pro-Western nor pro-Eastern. And it isn't anti-Western and pro-Eastern. What this is, is, as he says, a study of the ways in which the power, scholarship, and imagination of a 200-year-old tradition in Europe and America viewed the Middle East, the Arabs, and Islam. What you're getting in Orientalism is this wonderful study and a critique of thinking that Said presents by combing through history and literature beginning with the writings from Napoleon after his Egyptian campaigns, going through the travel memoirs of Chateaubriand, the writings on the Orient from Flaubert, looking at the writings of the Divan from Goethe, who was completely taken by Hafez. He shows wonderfully how these Europeans perceived and presented their vision of the Orient and how that has ingrained itself in our thinking. And so he says it was meant to be a study in critique of one powerful discursive system maintaining hegemony over another. In the preface, Said says, it is quite common to hear high officials in Washington and elsewhere speak of changing the map of the Middle East, as if ancient societies and myriad peoples can be shaken up like so many peanuts in a jar. But this has often happened with the Orient, that semi-mythical construct which, since Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in the late 18th century, 
has been made and renamed countless times by power acting through an expedient form of knowledge to assert that this is the Orient's nature and we must deal with it accordingly. Said says that his argument is that history is made by men and women, and that comes up again and again in Compass, just as it can be unmade and rewritten, always with various silences and illusions, always with shapes imposed and disfigurements tolerated so that our East, our Orient becomes ours to possess and direct. I should say again that I have no real Orient to argue for. I do, however, have a very high regard for the powers and gifts of the people of that region to struggle on for their vision of what they are and want to be. There is a profound difference between the will to understand for purposes of coexistence and humanistic enlargement of horizons and the will to dominate for the purposes of control and external enlargement of horizons and the will to dominate for the purposes of control and external dominion. And so quite simply, what we're talking about is investigating how people who have had an indelible effect on posterity, Goethe, Chateaubriand, Flaubert, how they have dealt with and synthesized and communicated or expressed their sense of the other, how this comes to be and why it's flawed and we should take caution. Right off the bat, we're introduced to Sarah, who's a very intriguing scholar and who brings up Sadeh Khadayat's The Blind Owl in one of her papers. Khadayat will show up again and again. This slim but horrifying work was an outrage in Iran. And then Hadayat ended up committing suicide in a Parisian apartment. And so we get that connection between Europe and the Orient right away, and specifically between France and the Orient. There's a long history between the French and the Ottomans, the French and Islam, the French and the Middle East. Enar is, of course, a French writer. And in this book, he's giving us a Viennese character who is able to divulge and expound on all of these connections in music between East and West, and also a French character in Sarah, who's able to bring in all manner of the humanities. Napoleon, of course, the Corsican, who is the French emperor, the first to penetrate into the Orient and then bring back his impression. This is the symbol of, in the modern world, the beginnings of Orientalism, which of course go back much, much farther. There's also the intriguing femme fatale, Marga d'Adorin, French adventurer and possible spy, murderer, and the first European to enter Mecca. And so on this score, Compass is a catalog of European excursions in and out of the Orient. With the influence of Said, with Matthias Enar's first-hand experiences in the Orient and his scholarly mind and his patience as a novelist. One question that presides over all the work then is how to achieve alterity with the impasse of representation. It's a love letter to Aleppo, Damascus, Tehran, Istanbul, the Persian Gulf, Syria, the Levant. In fact, in his envoi, or his afterword, his final parting words, he says, for the Syrian people. But beyond just showing the problem of representation between the two different people, Enar also wants to show us just how profound and far-reaching the effects are of the Orient on Europe. It's often said in this book, that Austria or Vienna is the gateway to the Orient. But in Enar's conception, all of Europe is a gateway to the Orient. The revolution in music of the 19th and 20th centuries owed everything to the Orient. That it was not a matter of exotic procedures, as was thought before. This exoticism had a meaning, that it made external elements, alterity, enter. It was a large movement and gathered together, among others, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Liszt, Berlioz, Bizet, Rimsky-Korsakov, Debussy, Bartok, Hindemith, Schoenberg, Jaminovsky, hundreds of composers throughout all of Europe, 
Over all of Europe, the wind of alterity blows. All these great men use what comes to them from the other to modify the self, to bastardize it. For genius wants bastardy, the use of external procedures to undermine the dictatorship of church chant and harmony. Why am I getting all worked up all alone on my pillow now? Probably because I'm a poor, unsuccessful academic with a revolutionary thesis no one cares about. So you can see he also <laughs> captures that despair from many modern academics. Another way to look at the books like Zone and Compass and many books that I love so much is to look at them as learned ramblings. And then there's the concept of the compass. The compass, just as a symbol, is a way to orient oneself in the world. Orient there is a double entendre, of course, the orient and orientation. He brings up the fact that Beethoven had a compass that was broken in such a way to where it didn't point to north, but pointed to east. He talks about carpets for Muslim prayer that have compasses built into them so that they can face east towards Mecca. I should buy myself a mosque alarm clock, the mosque of Medina or Jerusalem in gilded plastic with a little compass built in to indicate the direction of prayer. That's the superiority of the Muslim over the Christian. In Germany, they impose the scriptures on you in the back of the bedside table drawer. In Muslim hotels, they stick a little compass for you into the wood of the bed, or they draw a windrose marking the direction of Mecca on the desk. Compass and windrose that can indeed serve to locate the Arabic peninsula, but also, if you're so inclined, Rome, Vienna, or Moscow. You're never lost in these lands. Throughout the course of compass, you get indeed the supreme idea that what history is, is yes, made up of men and women, but also these successive representations of different people that are compounding and building upon one another. They're reified in Disney movies, such as Aladdin, and in political rhetoric that Saeed totally tears apart. And thus, a compass becomes more and more important to us as a way to orient ourselves within this constant cultural rhetoric. The question isn't in the reality of the idea. What interests me is understanding why and how so many travelers have seen Vienna and Budapest as the first oriental cities, and what that can teach us about the meaning they give to the word. And if Vienna is the gateway to the Orient, to what Orient does it actually lead? Sometimes the meaning of a work is atrociously amplified by history, multiplied, increased in horror. And finally, we get to the book that is the touchstone of Orientalism. We were princes, princes from the West that the Orient was welcoming and treating as such with refinement, obsequiousness, suave languor, and all of this conforming to the image our youth had constructed of the Oriental myth, gave us the impression of finally living in the lost lands of the Thousand and One Nights, which had reappeared for us alone. So in the end, Enar does a wonderful job of helping us to all really face the question that comes out of the study of Orientalism, the discipline of Orientalism, and question ourselves as to how we can stop and take a step back and realize where we are just simply repeating these representations of the other that have been handed down to us, whatever the other may be. I think more generally, this is the type of work that will help us moving forward to bridge these gaps between the things that polarize us. It's not about figuring out who's right and who's wrong. It's about being able to dissect and isolate viruses that have been handed down to us and then figure out the antidote for that virus so that we can move forward in a healthy manner. This is all part of thoughts that have been swimming around in my head these last few months as I visited Israel back in March and I read Amos Oz's A Tale of Love and Darkness. I witnessed Ukrainian refugees there. I've been reading Ukrainian literature 
modern Russian literature like Vladimir Sorokin. I've been reading Olga Tokarchuk, especially the books of Jacob. And now Orientalism revisiting Said's work, reading Einar. All this stuff has so many connections and one gets to a point where one longs for harmony. If you want to be transported to another place, if you want to experience beautiful landscapes and people, if you want to be intellectually stimulated while at the same time awakened and given the impetus for change in your own thinking and examination of things that you've just taken without any hint of skepticism, then you would do very well to start reading the work of Matthias Enach.